Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta and in Butte, Montana or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Thanks, Sherry. Hey, everybody. Thanks a lot for joining us. You know, each week we get to talk about how much we appreciate our sponsor's support. They help make all of this happen and provide us the ability to bring you each episode. With that, thanks to Bee Culture Magazine for continuing their presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture has been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. Subscribe to Bee Culture today. We also want to thank Two Million Blossoms as sponsor of this episode. Two Million Blossoms is a quarterly magazine dedicated to protecting all pollinators. Learn more in our Season 2, Episode 9 podcast with editor Kirsten Trainer, and from visiting www.2millionblossoms.com, and that is with a number two. Also, check out the new Two Million Blossoms podcast, also available from our website or from wherever you download and stream your podcast. Hey, Kim, happy Memorial Day. You got those steaks on the barbecue? Just waiting for me to get back to them. <laughs> well, it is Memorial Day, and we do want to send our appreciation and thanks to all of our veterans and current service men and women and their families for their sacrifice and service. Yeah, I've still got uh, family members in, in the service. Um one of them is dealing with the Afghanistan mess at the moment. Oh, my. Well, I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, uh, I've, been, I've had a great time this three-day weekend and and getting my bees. Uh, I've gotten a chance to get out into my bees. The weather's been good here. Um, and, and the nukes that I got a few weeks ago, they're all doing really strong. The one winter colony that I had uh, was trying to nurse along and trying to figure out how to get it up to strength, at least get it into the summer. It's finally... Well, it's being robbed out. So I've been really happy that you and Jim did that episode on uh, robbing. And it's, you know, if it, it it's, it's tough to see, but uh, I'm, help, I'm glad that you guys had that episode. Out yeah, there. Can, it, robbing in a bee yard can be ugly. It can be dangerous. Uh, and and uh, preventing it, of course, is always the first mode of action, but stopping it is the second, and knowing how to stop it fast can save a lot of bees and you a lot of trouble. Yeah. Well, I you know, I keep feeling bad about it, but then, and then I figured, well, if it happened to you and Jim, <laughs> then, you know, it kind of tempers the, tempers the, the sad feelings of, of being a bad beekeeper. <laughs> Well, we're not, we're, neither of us are bad beekeepers, but both of us get distracted too easily and, and, and d don't do due do diligence when it comes to uh, taking care of them. So that's my excuse and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> do you mind if I use that, do you? Not a bit. <laughs> oh, thanks. Hey, so, so it, uh, this out to our listeners. Uh, we started to post. Uh, transcripts of each episode. Now, we're not going back through the catalog of episodes out there, but we started a couple episodes ago using uh, posting transcripts. And we we hope this is useful for uh, beekeepers who might be hearing impaired or like the assistance or enjoy the, the possibility or the feature of reading a, a podcast uh, as, as you listen to it. So, We'd be interested in any feedback on the transcripts, and are they as useful as we think they are? Do you know beekeepers who are now able to benefit from listening or reading along to the podcast? We'd be interested to know what you think. The other advantage of having a transcript, Jeff, is the fact that I can go back and read carefully what was said to make sure that I understood it, because sometimes things go pretty fast. And and if you want to go back and listen to the 
you know, listen to the uh, podcast. Well, wh where was it in the, you know, was it the four minute mark or the seven minute mark or where was it? But with a, with a handwritten or with a, with a, a typed out uh, copy, you can skim it and find that fast and then read it a couple of times to make sure you understand it. And, and, uh, Kathy listens to a number of podcasts, and she has found that useful, as have other people that mm -hmm. I know. So um, if if you miss something during the show, print out the pod, print out the transcription and and you can go back and, and then you got a hard copy of it. You don't have to go back and listen. You can you know just keep it for yourself. Yeah. Well, we'd be interested in hearing from uh, you, the listeners. Uh, whether you find them useful or if you know other beekeepers who find them useful. And we're starting to produce them on Beekeeping Day podcast and also on Honey Bee Obscura. And speaking of Honey Bee Obscura, Kim, how's Honey Bee Obscura coming along in the podcast? Honey Bee Obscura, is, we're, we're doing fun. We've uh, come up with some questions about each other. And, and I don't know if you listen to Stephen Colbert, the, the show at night, but he has a way of questioning people that is somewhat different than you might suspect. Um, his question might be apples, bananas. And, and, and that we kind of approach things, uh, some of the topics that we studied, f kind of from that perspective is, is, you know, given a choice and then explain why that choice. Mm. Uh, and we cover a lot of ground in a hurry doing that. And it's, uh, it's been fun and it's, uh, we've gotten through some of the easy ones. We're getting a little harder now. Is that something like queen excluder? No queen excluder. I mean, it means something exactly. like that. All right. Yep. All right. Exactly. Oh boy. Boy, you could really throw some little bombs into that yes, too. Just a <laughs> <laughs> natural beekeeping or not. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, no, that's, that's really good. Well, I look forward to that. And, and if, if, if I was looking at the schedule, I think that's coming out here in the coming week. If I, if I saw that correctly. So, so everybody check out the Honey Bee Obscure with Kim and Jim and uh, see what you think of the questions. And finally, uh, before we get to our episode here with Rob Page, a couple of weeks ago, we did have our secret message at the end of the podcast and those mugs are going out. Uh, you got yours out, didn't you, Kim? I did, yes. Yeah. So, and I, I got come, some out and there's a couple of people that... Uh, that have not yet sent me their email or actually sent me their mailing address. So if you get those to me, you know who you are, then uh, I, I will get you your mugs. Otherwise we'll find the next two people on the list and send them. All right. So Kim, our guest today is Rob Page. Don't you have some history with him? Oh, I've known Rob Page a long time. He, uh, when he graduated, he for a while worked at the Baton Rouge uh, Bee Lab, and when he left there, he came up to the Madison Bee Lab, and uh, he and I were there at the same time, and uh, we were. That's where he developed uh, some of his um, closed closed mating procedures, and he worked at some other projects, and I got to know him a little bit. It was it was an interesting. He's um, he's one of those really 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 smart people, so. Uh, sometimes, sometimes we weren't very close together on, on some things just because he knew so much more, but, uh, he went from Madison, then he went to, uh, uh, California and then ended up in Arizona and he worked with, um, Kirsten. Ah. Kirsten was one of his graduate students there. So he, he's been around a long time. This is his, I want to say this is his third book. He did one on, with Harry Laidlaw on queen rearing. And then, and then a second edition of that one. And this one is way different. Mm. The book that we're going to talk about today is way different than his queen rearing book. Um, and, and here's what I want to do. I want to read you a sentence. Mark Winston, who you probably know and know of, um, summed up, summed up this book really well and how Rob approached it. He said, Rob's journey into the hive stimulates and inspires us to ponder our own place in nature and within our human societies. And that's exactly what this book does. It explores how bees and people are alike and how they're not alike. But be prepared to take a while to read this book. <laughs> it's fun to read. He's got a, he's got a nice, I'm not going to say almost humorous style, mm -hmm. but it's, it's deep. And 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 you'll need to spend some time figuring out what he's talking about. But when you do, 
it opens up a whole level to bees and people that you haven't seen before. Oh, fantastic. Well, I look forward to finishing my copy and, and, and looking forward to talking to Rob here in just a few moments. But first, a quick word from our friends at Strong Microbials. Hello, beekeepers. Your honeybees face a lot of challenges out there. Unbalanced food sources from monoculture crops, holding yards, drought, food shortages, antibiotics, pesticides, and pathogens like chalk brood. To overcome these challenges, your bees need the multiple bacteria that are in all nectars, pollens, and the environment. These bacteria aid honeybees' digestion and improve your honeybees' response and resilience to pesticides. Now you can help improve your honey colony health with a quick, easy, and safe-to-use product. Strong Microbial's Super DFM Honeybee uses naturally occurring bacteria to restore the healthy gut biome of your honeybees. Check them out today at www.strongmicrobials.com. And while you're visiting Strong Microbials, make sure you sign up for their newsletter, The Hive. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Sitting across the virtual table right now is Dr. Rob Page. Rob, welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast. Well, thank you for inviting me. Well, it's been a long time, Rob. How long has it been oh, since we were gosh, doing bees yeah. in Madison? Yeah, I mean, it <laughs> must have been since about 80. Yeah, about 80. About 80. 80? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it was before I went to Ohio State. Right, right. Yeah. And I went there in 86. So You and Emmett Harp. That was a fun. That was a that was a nice team to watch. You guys looked like you worked well together. I don't I don't know how you got along with him, how well you got along, but you guys worked well together. It was easy to work with him. Yep. Emmett, Emmett had so much knowledge, and he was always trying to show me important things, such as what happens when you bang a lid on top of <laughs> on top of the hive, and the bees start stinging me. He loved to do that. So, <laughs> well, it sounds uh, like a, a great friend. <laughs> Of course, <laughs> I, I was a I was a newfer, so I, I had to earn my stripes. Yeah, Jeff. Just for a little background, Rob and I were working worked at the uh, Honey Bee Research Lab, USDA Honey Bee Research Lab in Madison. Rob was a visiting scientist, and I was a gopher. Uh, but but uh, we were there. I don't know. You were there. What about three years? Yeah, uh, four, three to three to four, four years, years. Yeah. Yeah, and you did a lot of work. In there. You did a lot of work there on your closed population buyout or uh, mating, right? Yeah, I did. I did a lot of work on uh, building the models and the concept. And uh, yeah, that was a very fruitful time. I was very proud to be at the North Central Apicultural Research Lab. You know, with all the history that it had had, and for me, it was a great honor to be there doing stuff associated with honeybee breeding. Yeah, and I was there because was I could grow soybeans. <laughs> you were that's right and you were doing you were doing your master's yep. so, Rob you have a, a, a big history and and a background in bees and and bee research but one of the things I found fascinating and we we're talking a little bit just prior to recording is is your work on decoding the honeybee genome can you just real briefly touch on you know what's the significance of that and and maybe a little bit of how you accomplished that well, my own personal interest in in the, the honeybee genome was uh, I, I was trying to understand complex behavior in honeybees, and I took on studying the amount of pollen stored in the comb as a um, as a, 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 a phenotype. That's what you actually observe when you're looking at organisms. You know, they have a genotype, and then the genotype plus the environment that they're in produces the phenotype that you think, that you see. Like you see me and this is my phenotype at 71 years old. And I, but I have a genotype inside of me that codes for certain things. And then the, this is the result of lots and lots and lots of interactions and biological interactions at very many different levels mm -hmm. from, from the genes themselves inside of the cells that are making proteins and then the cells make collective tissues that go with organs that may be sensing flower odors or whatever, which then go into the brain, which then integrates some filters on and, and then 
uh, results in responses back to the motor system and the bees fly. And, and then on the next level of organization and all this is the, is the way that they interact and they, they, they dance on the combs and they recruit new recruits and, and um, they feed larvae and they get chemical signals from each other. And this is all part of that big social milieu that we look at that results in how much pollen they store in the comb or how much honey they store in the comb. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to understand it at all those different levels. And then the gene level was certainly the, the ultimate target level so that we could, we could reconstruct uh, across these levels of biological organization how, how the DNA inside of a cell becomes 50 square inches of pollen stored in the comb. Yeah. And so that's why I I eventually got down to working on the genome project, which was spearheaded by Gene Robinson, at the University of Illinois, who was my first postdoc when I was at Ohio State. But Gene did a remarkable job of doing all the political organization and everything that went into getting this genome done so that we could then start looking for genes that had effects that could be of importance to us, me as a behaviorist. Uh, you know, b trying to breed traits into bees that make them, you know, more viable commercially to make them uh, more gentle to, to handle uh, dealing with disease resistance. So it was a very important thing to get done. And, and as a matter of fact, because of Gene's efforts, it was, you know, like the third animal in line of all the sequencing that was done many years ago, it got to the top of the list. Wow. And also it, with it, 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 it was also involving some beekeepers who were directly involved. The weavers in Texas were directly involved because um, Danny Weaver actually has a degree in molecular biology, I think, from Berkeley. And he was very active in getting all the politics laid out and the, and the coordination with uh, the labs that were doing the sequencing. So it was a wonderful effort. It was a collective effort between beekeeping and 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 and, and industry and 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 academics uh, and, the, and the federal government to get it done. Wow. What, what a coordination effort that would have been. It was major. It was, it was a very, very significant coordinated effort to, to, to get it done. Just listening to how you organized it was complex, Rob. It, organized which? <laughs> <laughs> I did, the organization of, the, of the, the Genome Project was, was Danny Weaver and Gene Robinson. That was the partnership that really that really did it and pushed it. You know, it, you don't want too many cooks in the kitchen at one time, right? And they they knew how to do it and they brought it together. So is the full honeybee genome mapped now? It's mapped. I mean, I I was just yesterday, I was just yesterday looking at some of the sequence and I had a problem I was trying to solve an old problem coming back for some reason I was looking at it again, but it's it's been through many revisions and it's still and people add to it and it, then it gets reassembled and, and it, it's done to the extent that it's very usable, but, you know, it may never get completely done. I mean, cause it's a huge thing. There's, you know, we still have gaps, um, but you know, most of the important stuff has been found and is in it. Very interesting. And I remember when that was announced and it was pretty, pretty significant. It holds true today. Yep. yep it does. Well, thank you. Well, Jeff, you know that Rob's done um, over the years a couple of other a couple of books. We're good. Yeah. We want to talk to him today about his latest, but he did one with uh, Harry Laidlaw, Queen Rearing and Bee Breeding, and I think that the, I think there's two two editions of that, Rob. There's only, only one, one, but we're we're working uh, diligently on the second. Not Harry and me, because Harry's been dead a long time. But we are we are working diligently right now on on the. Um, on the revision. And I, I've got uh, uh, Kirsten Trainer, who you, many of you know Kirsten. She was my, my last, my final um, graduate student at Arizona State University. And she's uh, an excellent, superb writer and editor and uh, photographer. And so we're working together. I've invited her in to be, to be another author. So it'll still be laid along pages with Trainer on there too. <laughs> uh, we're redoing all the pictures and color to try to make it update updated a little bit and and going back through i mean you know there's things in there that you know that were recommendations in 1920 <laughs> <laughs> that, 
that have changed. So we're updating it and we want to get something else out there. It was, it was published in 1997. And for some time now, I felt a little bit embarrassed about, I mean, it still, it still sells, it still sells pretty well, but it's out of date. It needs to be updated. And so we're working hard to try to get it done by the end of this summer, maybe. Well, your second book then, Rob, The Spirit of the Hive, which came out in 2013, was, I'm going to say, vastly different than Queen Rary? Yeah, that 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 book was you know, a sort of, you know, you're sort of, you get near the end of your career and you look back and you say, you know, how do all the dots connect? You know, how did, what was I doing for the last 30 years? And that book was kind of that. I mean, and it was, you know, I really spent 30 years doing almost one, just one thing. I mean, I was really focused. Most most researchers work on a lot of different things, but I was really kind of focused on this one question. And but I did a lot of different things, and I did things in pop, population genetics, uh, looking at how you know genes and populations change due to selection, and, and and but yet they were all connected together. So this was a book that connected the dots for for me, for of all the different kinds of research I did from when I was at, at Wisconsin uh, and all through my career. So this is a book that's built in stratified layers and they're, histor- they're, they're layers of time in my life. I mean, so you, the things that I went through and how they stratified, but they were all really working towards one goal. And that was to understand complex social behavior for foraging. In bees, and that was the. But all those other parts of it were things that built up to it. And I want the story. I wanted the story to be a story of discovery. You know how one thing led to the next, to the next, to the. I mean, I didn't have a plan thirty years ago when I was in Wisconsin about where this was going to go. But I had a, I had a question that that I was working on. But each time, each each time you got something done, you know, it kind of led to the next thing and the next thing. And it was also a a story about science as a community. You know, students, postdocs that worked with me and for me, and then there's and then I mean I have students who have students who are who are working on these projects. So it was showing this community and how this community works together. That was my goal. Well, you've just come out with another one, and it's called the Art of the Bee, and and I've been through it a couple of times, but Explain to our audience the art of the bee. Yeah, the art the art of the bee came to me. There's a couple of things converged. When I was provost of the university at, at Arizona State University, uh, one of the things that I was really disappointed in was how we teach science to non-science majors. These young people come in from high school and they, you know, they have to take a certain number of science courses. And so they'll take you know, the introductory biology course. They'll take the introductory geology course, maybe, or the introductory bio, not bio, um, an introductory course in chemistry. And those courses were mostly just learning vocabulary. You know, you spend, you spend a semester and you learn the vocabulary for, for physics or whatever. I didn't like that that particular approach, you know, and, and and then I looked at textbooks and textbooks themselves are based on stratified layers of organization, uh, starting with uh, the, the begin a biology textbook. You're starting off with with the the um, ta- taxonomic classification of animals and then you move into to, you know, the the distribution of animals on on Earth and ecology. I mean, so. I, I really thought that there was a better way of doing it. So that was one of the things that motivated me was to write a book that someone could 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 read that was more like my view of how I thought introductory science should be taught um, to non-scientists. The other thing that motivated me about the book, to do the book, was um, uh, I had read some of the works of Alexander von Humboldt. Uh, von Humboldt was an explorer, a naturalist. And from 1799 to 1804, he explored uh, northern South America, and he went into Mexico, and he documented everything he saw. 
he he was really what they call a polymath. He knew a little a lot about everything. So he studied geography. He studied geology. He studied the the um, uh, ionization of the atmosphere and atmospheric pressures. He defined uh, ecological systems. He climbed the highest peak in the Andes because nobody had been up there before to actually do measurements uh, of of the of the temperature and the and the air pressure and 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 so anyway so he brought all this together the, and and also he studied the Native Americans there that were living there the indigenous people and so he kind of had this view of the world that integrated all these things together and he wrote that way when you went and you read you read his his books his travel log and and whatnot you saw you saw that you know in any one paragraph he could be talking about the indigenous people he could be talking about um, air pressure and how it changes as you go up in elevation and then he'd be talking about how you, if you go if you go up a mountain and you see the changes in the kinds of plants that are up going up a mountain it was the same as if you went from the equator north in the in uh, in latitude, and so he was. He said, "Gee, you know, there's communities of these things that work together," and so that's how he wrote. He kind of blended it all together. So I wanted to do something like that, and i i wanted I wanted to write something that a that a an educated person of any level, high school education, whatever, but but who had an interest and a, a passion about bees could take could learn something uh, that has a lot of facts in it you know, a lot of factual information that built around an interesting theme. And so that's how I went about writing, writing the book. I, the different chapters are, are interesting central themes within a chapter. You're going to learn a little bit of a lot of different kinds of things about, about honeybee biology behavior. Actually, you summed that up for me quite well, because I, it all kind of came together when you just explained it, because that's, uh, I, I, I'm not going to say it was difficult to read, but it, without that explanation, it was it was it wasn't quite as clear to me as it, as it as it is now. And I can see how you built it. I think that's how you would look at it. You built it that way. Typically, books have a hierarchical kind of construct to them. I mean, books that are that are anything other than novels they don't tend to be hierarchical. But but you know, books that are, that are that are educational. That are are scientific books or academic books, they have a hierarchical structure. I threw that out. I said I'm not going to do that. Then I started finding myself making these these outlines, these detailed outlines. And then I found out when I look at the outlines, well, outlines you have an A and a B, and then you have a one and a two, and a little A, little B, little C. That it, it just reconstruct reconstructs it. I threw it out. I just had some notes. And I forced myself, which is really hard for a scientist, because you know we are we think in a very organized way and we write scientific papers in a very organized way. I threw it out, and I had to kind of general notes of where I wanted to go, and I tried to write it that way. And um, I succeeded better in some places than in others, but uh, sometimes you know I, I also brought in a lot of personal stories and things because I, I that's all that's still all a part of science, right? There's a sociology of science. I bet your publisher had fun with this. <laughs> Better Bee is pleased to sponsor today's episode of Beekeeping Today podcast. For over 40 years, Better Bee has supplied beekeepers across the country with the tools, equipment, and knowledge needed to succeed. Because many Better Bee employees are beekeepers themselves, they understand your needs and challenges and are better prepared to answer your beekeeping questions. From their colorful catalog to their support of beekeeper educational activities, including this podcast, Better Bee truly lives up to their tagline of beekeepers serving beekeepers. See for yourself at betterbee.com. I'll tell you something remarkable. I mean, uh, well, I, I sent it to one academic journal first. I mean, academic publisher first. They came back and they said, oh, they want to change this. They want to change that. And they really want me to make it more about this or that. And, and I thought about it. I said, no, that's not the book I want to write. That's the book I didn't want to write. And so I sent it to Oxford University Press and they took it as is. Wow. Well, that's good. They, they were uh, wise enough to see the, 
the the goal there that you had in mind? They got it. They they wrote me back and they understood that it was different and they got it. And I mean, I I I all I all I had on it was you know your 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 typical copy editing was done on it, but they didn't ask me to change one thing. Hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. Well, I, I, I've got some questions that I'd like you to uh, spread out for me a little bit. And and the biggest one, of course, is is the evolution of the superorganism. Yeah. Um, therein lies for me. That was that was to me the most interesting piece of this book. The whole concept of the well, superorganism is is really fascinating. Yeah, well, the super the superorganism concept has been out there for a long time, mm-hmm. and and in different forms. So I, you know, I don't even want to sit around and talk about what you know what is a superorganism in, in its strict definition. Because you'll find definitions of what a superorganism is that are so def- so narrowly defined that bees are not superorganisms. There's only like maybe one group of ants that are, or or you have others that everything's a superorganism. The Earth is a superorganism because it's got this in, this this integrated uh, uh, um, biology. I mean, so I, I don't get into that. To, to me, a superorganism is something that that is organized for reproduction, uh, defense, and nutrition, and in some way that's composed of other organisms, but they're organized in such a way that they share all of that. And they and they so a honeybee society would be a superorganism because it's organized with respect to reproduction, reproduction through the queen, uh, centralized. It's, it's organized for defense. It's organized for nutrition. And so when you look at the functioning of it, you know you can make an analogy. You can say, well, the the bees themselves are like the cells of a body. The queen is like the the germ line, the reproductive tissues. So you can make build these analogies, but the simple fact is is that they're organized in, around these three themes or three th- things, and um, function uh, collectively towards those ends. The superorganism is a concept that I think fits in, in very, very much of a fascination when you look at honeybees and the way the way that 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 they behave uh, as a collective. So I had one chapter is about the superorganism. And I kind of go in and talk about its origins, where it came from, the people who are really important for developing the concept itself. And then also, you know, I, I think I have a brief bit in there where I kind of cast the honeybee colony, the society of the honeybee, how it fits this superorganism concept that, um, that has been used for a long time. Then the next chapter I get into, you know, but how do they evolve? I mean, so you've got you've got this this problem, this fundamental problem. I mean, if you want to look at Darwinian evolution, you have you know what what it requires is that that there be individuals, reproductive individuals in a population that have different characteristics. Those that have some characteristics out survive and out reproduce those that have the alternative characteristics. So it comes back to personal reproduction. If you don't reproduce, reproduce, it can't evolve. So how do you evolve these traits where some individuals don't reproduce at all? And then not only do you have some individuals don't reproduce at all, but those that don't reproduce, they actually themselves are differentiated into doing different kinds of things, like the different tasks that they perform. And in an ant, you know, you have in the same colony, you, you have individuals that don't reproduce, and some of them are great big giant soldier ants, and others are little teeny tiny minims. How do you get that kind of complex structure to evolve? And that's what that chapter is about. And I use pollen hoarding in honeybees as an example, because there I can show how selection on a, on a social trait, the amount of pollen stored in the comb is a social trait. Selection on that social trait changed things at very many different levels of organization. It changed the signaling of larvae to the nurse bees with respect to how much food they get fed and affect, and that those larval signals affect foragers who go out and make decisions whether to ke- collect pollen or collect nectar. So my selection changed that signaling system. It changed the, the, the perception of individual bees with respect to how much pollen do we need versus how much we have. So some of the bees ended up, you know, they, 
they walk around on the hive and they say, oh gosh, we have more pollen than we need and we're not going to collect anymore. And the others walk around the hive and they say, well, we don't have enough. We're going to collect some more. Uh, it, it changed It changed their reproductive physiology in the workers. Remember, worker bees can reproduce. They do have ovaries. And that reproductive system of theirs is actually used by the bees to determine if they're going to be foraging for pollen or foraging for nectar. It changed that system as well to where like my high strain bees that I selected for high pollen hoarding, they have a physiology of their, of their reproductive system that favors collecting more protein. Whereas my low strain bees that I selected who collect less pollen, their physiologies have been, reproductive physiologies have been changed to where they collect less protein. All those different levels change as a consequence of this selection. I selected for one thing and I changed everything all the way down to the genes. I call this reverse engineering. <laughs> so one of the things I, so when I, so when I, I, when my book went out for review, for the peer review, one of the reviewers came back and said, why didn't Rob talk more about humans and draw parallels, you know, the superorganism and all, why didn't they draw parallels with humans? And so I sat around and I thought about it. And I thought that I had selected on what could be considered the economy of the hive, you know, the, 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 the proportions of pollen versus, versus honey that's produced or stored. So that's sort of the economy of the hive. I, I affected that, you know, my high strain bees collect enormous amounts of pollen and my, my low strain bees collect a lot less. And, but what I did is I reverse engineered the entire social structure of the nest. So I selected on the economy and I reverse engineered the social structure. I reverse engineered the, the physiology of the individual worker bees, the kinds of things that they were sensitive to, the cues they were tuning into to, de to determine what they forage for. And in a sense, we do the same. You know, our, you know, selection on our economy reverse engineers a lot of our social structures. I, mean, I think we're going through it right now. I mean, look at pan the pandemic we went through. And, and the pandemic was a case of, of a pathogen that disrupted our economic system, which then ended up reverse engineering our social system to where, you know, we're doing a lot of things differently today in our behavior and in our social behavior than we did before. Interesting comparison. And uh, I see where it comes from. How neat. Um, you know, I, I'm going to just take this thing out of context for a minute. You had... A, a, a place in there where you were comparing, uh, I guess you it was the, the the chapter that was dealing with altruism, and you compared the society of bees to the preamble of the Constitution. When you get down, when you, when you look at, at at political philosophy, when we decided to become a republic, or we as individuals decided to join into a republic and live within a republic. There are certain principles or certain things that we bought into. First of all, is we gave up what are called your natural rights. So you know we no longer are supposed to live totally selfishly. I mean we're we're you know our personal rights are reproduction, protection, nutrition. These are things that are personal rights to us, and so we have power and will. You know we have power associated with with maintaining the or accumulating and maintaining those for ourselves and we have the will to do it but according to political philosophy when we join a republic and live in a republic we give up our personal will and we give up our personal power we relinquish it to the state now our constitution spells out what we get in return particularly the bill of rights so you know we give up you know we're not i'm not going to stand at the border of my property and you know, with my gun and I'm shoot at my neighbors if they get too close to my house because I gave up that particular protective power and I've given it instead to this Republic that I've the state that I belong to. And in return for me giving that up and obeying their laws, they're gonna be defending it for me. They're gonna be protecting those things for myself. When you look at social insects, they've done the same thing. They've given up, if you look at a honeybee colony, you know, the, the, 
the uh, individual worker, you know, she she has no will of her own. I mean, she the will is the collective the collective will of the colony, so to speak, and and all of her powers are directed towards working for the nutrition, the defense, and the reproduction of the colony as a whole, not for herself. She's not out there looking to lay her own eggs, uh, uh, store, storing food in cells just for her to go back and feed, feed out of herself. So you, you, you see these, these parallels. And in the end, if you really look at it, no society will survive unless they adapt tacitly those very principles. And, you know, we call you know, political philosophers, you know, they, they look at all of this and, and they say that these are the fundamental principles of social living, that these are the guarantees that have to be in place or it won't work. It's the social contract that's made between the individual and the state. These do the same thing. It's not a written contract. It's not written out on the piece of beautifully scripted parchment like our Bill of Rights or our Constitution is, is written out on. It's written in their DNA, but it's there. It's been etched in it over millions of years by natural selection. It sort of makes looking at those bees in the box in the backyard vastly different now, as you explained it. I like the way that you, you said it in the beginning. You have a little bit of a lot of things in every chapter and and we're running a little we're running a little bit late. I I just the one thing one more thing, the song of the queen, and then we'll have to go. But tell me a little bit about the song of the queen. Well, that was my that was my most fun chapter. I I really I really wanted I enjoyed doing that. The back the history of that comes back to it was the early nineteen fifties, um, and E. B. White wrote a poem. It was called The Song of the Queen Bee. It was a poem about the queen and there, you know, she goes and she flies through the air and she mates with anybody she wants and she's happy-go-lucky. And then it comes down and talks about, oh, but there's these terrible geneticists who are trying to instrumentally inseminate her and take all that away. It was in response to Harry Laidlaw. <laughs> <laughs> Harry, but Harry, Harry had, Harry had, had you know, fi- figured out the, the the problem that had been taken that had taken place or that existed in inseminating queens. I mean, they've been trying to do this for a long, long time, but he finally figured out that the valve fold was blocking it. And so that opened up this whole thing to, I think it was the Atlantic Monthly that it was published. Anyway, that that it opened up instrumental insemination. Evie White wrote this poem <laughs> <laughs> and talked about bemoaning these these old geneticists that are you know taking away this. And, and so I started thinking about, you know, the song of the queen, you know, what, what is the song? The song of the queen is orchestrated in many different ways. It's orchestrated through, you know, the sounds, the, 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 the piping and the tooting and, and, the, and the, the whirl of the wings as they push the queen out to go on a mating flight and, and, um, and the popping sounds of the drones ejaculating in the air and drum beats falling to the ground and, I just had fun, but in the meantime, I'm trying. I'm telling you about drone congregating areas and where they came from, and and you know how do they make a queen, and and the and the communication system between the larvae and the nurse bees. You know, so I talk. That's a that's part of the song, but it's it's a song that's sung in chem, with chemicals. So I talk about the um, the different chemicals that are used and and how they respond to them. So that, that was fun. That was that was the most fun chapter for me to write. It it was just sort of a lark. And it didn't fit anywhere. <laughs> if, you, if you if you noticed, Kim, when you went through my book, it was just sort of like at the end. <laughs> I stretch. I tried to stretch it to put it in. I thought it fit okay. because yeah. because the rest of the book is. I don't have a good word. It, it fit because the rest of the book is very similar in terms of how each chapter is structured. So uh, uh, I enjoy. I enjoyed it. I I enjoyed reading it probably even more than you enjoyed writing it. So. Uh, <laughs> Rob, the book is The Art of the Bee, and where can I get it? Uh, Oxford University Press. And Amazon, I'm sure. Oh, am- oh yeah, Amazon, <laughs> yeah, sure. Amazon sells it. You can get it directly from, from Oxford yep. University Press. All right. Well, Rob, this has been fun. It's been too long since we've had a chance to chat, and we'll, we'll definitely do it again when you write your next book. Is that okay? 
That sounds good to me. Okay. Look forward to having you back on uh, when you do have that next uh, the release of the next book out. Well, thank you. Thanks, Rob. Take care. Thanks for joining you us. You too. I really enjoyed having, I say that all the time. I, I enjoy all our guests, but it was really fun having uh, Rob on the, on the podcast. Uh, and, and to find out that I know I probably was told this at some point, but to have that connection with Kirsten too, it kind of brings, so, you know, beekeeping today and Kirsten and Rob Page and you, boy, just, it's a big circle, isn't it? Well, he said it was a community. That's the good and. Uh, and and uh, he it certainly points it out. Kirsten is a student for him. He and I working together at the Madison Lab a lot of years ago, and now we all come together on a podcast. That's pretty cool, <laughs> I think. And and I got to tell you, I got to tell you, reading that book was uh, was what's the word I want to use here? Reading that book, it wasn't a challenge, but it it, it made me think about so many things that after three pages I had to rest. <laughs> But it, <laughs> it 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 is it's it's a delight to read, and the the last chapter, the song of the queen, is just it's just a song. Mm-hmm. That's what it is. You can tell he had fun writing it. Yeah, it's it's definitely a heavy, a, a heavy book. It's not your typical beekeeping um, book, in my opinion. No, but but beekeepers are gonna beekeepers are gonna recognize everything in yeah, there. Yeah, just from a different perspective. Yeah. The, the perspective of the superorganism, if you will, but how they're all, all the parts are connected. Like I said, it's just not bees in a box in the backyard anymore. <laughs> no, it's not. No, it's not. Well, I encourage everybody to get out and and, and look up uh, Robert E. Page Jr., The Art of the Bee, The Shaping the Environment from Landscapes to Societies. It's a good book. I'm glad he, he was on. Yep. Well, that about wraps it up. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download and stream the show. Your vote helps other beekeepers find us quicker. Even better, write a review and let other beekeepers looking for a new podcast know what you like. You can get there directly from our website by clicking on reviews along the top of any web page. As always, we thank Bee Culture, the magazine for American beekeeping, for their continued support of the Beekeeping Today podcast. If you want to thank our regular episode sponsor, Global Patties, check them out at www.globalpatties.com. We also want to thank Strong Microbials for their continued support of this podcast. Check out their probiotic line at www.strongmicrobials.com. We want to thank Better Bee for joining us as the latest supporter. Check out their full line of beekeeping supplies at www.betterbee.com. And finally, and most importantly, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to send us questions and comments at questions at Beekeeping Today podcast. We'd love to hear from you. Anything else, Kim? I think that wraps it up. I need a rest. (laughs) (laughs) There you go. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody.